Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, today's session on medical professionalism. Um, we're delighted that, um, uh, that our speaker will be Dr. Jerry Menikoff, who, um, who about, about 20 years ago was a fellow in the, yes, 91, 92. Yes, more than 20 years ago. 91, 92. Was, a, was an ethics fellow um, in the McLean Center program. We were together. At, we're with Peter year. Angelos. What, what, what year was it? Was it 1991? Peter uh, Ubel, Peter Angelos. Ellen Fox. Ellen Fox. Ellen Fox what a class. Jerry Menikoff, my God. It's a tough crowd. Uh, yes. And then, then after, uh, uh, after leaving uh, the McLean Center Fellowship, Jerry went to the New York Eye and Ear uh, clinic or infirmary. infirmary and trained in ophthalmology and, um, and finished his five or six years of ophthalmology training um, in Lower Manhattan. Um, and uh, uh, when did you get the JD degree? Uh, I had gotten the JD degree years earlier. ago. So, yeah. so that, that had been earlier. So as an MD, JD, Jerry went to the University of uh, uh, Kansas um, and uh, taught both in law school and in the medical school um, uh, with research interests in bioethics and more particularly the ethics of research on human subjects. In, in part, that explains uh, uh, Jerry Menikoff's current role uh, as the director of the OHRP. Uh, the OHRP is the office um, for Human Research Protections, uh, which is a portion of the Office of Public Health and Science in the Secretary's Office at DHHS. Um, and um, in, in that role, we, Jerry and I were chatting before we came down to the meeting. Um, he has some thoughts about substantially revising the um, informed consent rules and regulations, which are not, not an easy thing to change. Um, that they, they've pretty much been there since the original 1981 legislation. Uh, and, and to make them more um, uh, consumer protective or patient protective or subject protective, it would, would be a goal. But uh, there, there's a complicated political and social process involved. Uh, today, Jerry is going to talk about professionalism and clinical investigation. Welcome back to the center, Jerry. Welcome Thank back. You Thank you. Uh, it's, you know, I guess I could sort of stand here. Is that going to work, too? Um, thank you so much for a lovely introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be back here. Uh, as, as was obvious, it was a great year, and uh, I'm sure all of us learned a lot, and I'm, I suspect a lot of you who are continuing to participate in Mark's program uh, are learning a great deal. Um, uh, I probably that? should talk louder, right? Okay. I will talk louder. Thank you. Um, so, um, I know these talks are about professionalism. Unlike a lot of your other scholars who have spoken here before, I am not an expert on professionalism. Um, I actually use this as an opportunity to learn a little bit about the role of professionalism in the area of clinical research. And hopefully, we could have some interesting discussion about this. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Sort of. OK. So I'll try to speak up a little more. Um, Dreaded disclaimer, these are just my own personal views, not necessarily the views of anybody within HHS. Okay, so what I want to particularly focus on is the area of physician researchers, sort of the overlap of being a physician involved in clinical care and also being a researcher. That is one area that in terms of professionalism actually has gotten a fair bit of attention and has raised a number of what I think are interesting and important issues in terms of ethics, in terms of what sort of relationships exist in these scenarios. So that's in particular going to be my focus here. And, and sort of 
my premise is that it is interesting, unlike the clinical relationship, which I think in many ways we sort of know the core values, uh, it is surprising how much there is in terms of controversy about basic aspects of professionalism in the relationship between researchers and subjects. And to give it an analogy, imagine that you were regularly seeing in the major journals where these sorts of an articles get published, discussions of you know, beneficence, non-maleficence, maybe this stuff is all crap. And in fact, that's not at all part of the regular doctor-patient relationship. But yet that's the sort of thing that happens in the area of, of research and professionalism, that we in fact have major articles coming out regularly that seem to be disputing core aspects of that relationship. And it's sort of interesting, why is this happening? So I will try to spell out some of that. Um, I know a lot of your prior talks in this series go through sort of various specific elements relating to what is it that characterizes a profession. Uh, I'm not pretending that this is a particularly exhaustive list. I just put a few core elements here. And by and large, these characteristics are also used in terms of being a research professional. Uh, there's a specialized body of knowledge. Uh, there's a degree of self-regulation. People get together in terms of associations. There is a self-generated code of ethics. And in particular, sort of the final thing I want to highlight is there is a norm of altruism, a notion of service to others. And in particular, uh, I'm going to sort of distinguish that in particular in terms of the, the researcher-subject relationship because that, that is a little different and that does raise a legitimate issue of how much do these rules apply in terms of what we think of, of core aspects that, that make you a profession. Is there something unique about the researcher-subject relationship that's somewhat different? Um, so as, as part of preparing for this, I, I wanted to see what was out there, again in terms of sort of black and white stuff, discussing the role of researchers as professionals. And you actually come across uh, a few groups that are actually, you know, organized associations that deal with being a research professional. And there actually aren't that many of these groups. And, and I think it's sort of noteworthy in particular that there aren't that many of these groups. And by and large, they're probably not, not the most prominent groups. Uh, and, and, and we could have some discussion afterwards in terms of how much any of you are involved with some of these groups. Uh, so the major one in terms of physicians in particular, physician researchers, is the Academy of Physicians and Clinical Research, APCR. Um, and it is an affiliate of a much larger group. Uh, they're sort of highly related and of the same central organizational offices. The Association of Clinical Research Professionals, ACRP. Again, the latter group involves a lot of people beyond just physicians. Uh, the former group is basically the physician element of that. And uh, let me tell you, I'm going to go through a few, uh, you know, quotes from applicable policies and that sort of stuff. So this is sort of the dry part of it, and we'll get on to sort of more fun stuff. But I guess you have to go through some of these basics in terms of the actual ethical and professional rules they have. Apply. So this is APCR's mission to advance medical innovation and public health by providing advocacy, promoting competence, and encouraging exchange for and among physicians involved in or affected by clinical research. Probably the similar sort of mission you have from, from clinical physician groups and, and similar sorts of things. Um, and this is how they describe themselves. I will take this as truthful. It is the leading professional organization exclusive to physicians that supports and addresses the unique issues and challenges of physicians in clinical research. Uh, it has approximately 1,200 members versus the parent, the larger group, which is not mainly physicians, has about 18,000. I don't know exactly what to make of that, but my, my gut sense is that this is not a huge number in terms of the number of physicians out there that are actually involved in clinical research. I suspect there are far more physicians, even percentage-wise comparing to the AMA or something. Most physicians in clinical research are not part of this group. And, and just to give you my probably not worth a lot take on this, a lot of people, this is sort of, I don't know if you call it the bad side or the pragmatic side of being a professional. Many groups 
constitute themselves as, procession, as professions to increase their prestige, to increase their authority, to create some monopoly elements by which they could regulate themselves. Well, if you're a non-physician who's involved in clinical research, you probably don't have the M, well, you, right, you don't have the MD, you probably don't have other degrees that make you very clearly a professional, and therefore it's very important for you to in fact create yourself and organize yourselves as a professional. On the other hand, for most MD researchers, it is probably the MD that is the core of your professionalism, and therefore you don't need to be a researcher professional, and therefore you don't necessarily need this other group to, to you know, work for you in terms of making the public know how professional you are. So I, I guess in a sense that makes sense that there really isn't, a lot in, in terms of this pragmatic aspect of this, there probably isn't a lot of attention paid by physician professionals to sort of being part of this organization or needing it to kind of, you know, make the public aware of them as professionals. They clearly are professionals and they probably don't care that much about this aspect of it. On the other hand, for the ACRP members, it's a much bigger push. A lot of them do stuff that probably is fairly technical, um, that again, the public isn't aware of these people. They do need the prestige of being professionals. So that's some degree of the oddity here, and again, a bit of an explanation as to why perhaps you're just not hearing a lot about physician researchers as professionals. But as we'll see, there are, again, some interesting issues that sort of deal with the overlap on the ethics side of things. So I want to tell you at least a little bit about um, this organization in terms of what it says it's doing. It has a number of bylaws. Um, it wants to enhance the organization's value. Again, the sort of things these groups try to do, uh, represent research physicians, enhance their proficiency, promote acquisition and dissemination of knowledge, and at last, and I sure the fact that it's last, I don't know what that means. I wouldn't necessarily make too much of the fact that it's last, but it does say it will protect the welfare of patients and study subjects. So it's in there, but yes, it is last. Um, it does have a code of ethics and professional conduct. It doesn't distinguish which aspects of these are ethics as opposed to professional conduct, and often it's unclear you know, one of these vague dividing lines. Um, here it's getting to the sort of things you often do hear about in terms of research ethics. Be mindful of the important distinctions between medical practice and research. Um, the second bullet here I want to pay particular attention to because I'm going to say a lot more about it in particular. Uh, this is getting to that issue of some degree of confusion out there about what this field is really about, except ensuring the safety and welfare of human subjects and patients as their highest goal. So there they're being very affirmative about this, but let's talk a little bit about in a few minutes about is that really what they're doing? Uh, execute the work in accordance with standards of scientific objectivity, very reasonable, continue to advance professional knowledge, safeguard professional judgment, uh, here we're getting into some more standard, the last bullet here, bioethical principles, principles of respect for persons, practice of obtaining informed consent are honored at all times in spirit and in practice. So, you know, the standard stuff you'd expect, uh, observe legal stuff, avoid conflicts of interest, adhere to all relevant ethical standards, okay? So nothing incredibly surprising, probably similar to what you'd hear in other organizations, even just physician. Uh, not specifically research-oriented organizations, uh, abiding by all applicable laws, regulations, ethical codes, et cetera. Okay. Uh, just want to point out there's another organization. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. SOCRA, I think Society of Clinical Research Associates. SOCRA is actually also open to physician members. I'm not aware that it, it has a specific subunit for physician researchers, but again, it is another one of these groups that is trying to kind of elevate the prestige and the professionalism of people working in clinical research. It has a much shorter um, ethics statement, only four, uh, four items. Um, starts out actually number one, respecting the research participants with regards to self-determination and full disclosure. Um, I believe research participants should be free from harm and exploitation uh, in accordance with risk and benefits. Sounds good. Uh, research participants should have right to receive fair and confidential treatment and you'll be accountable to adhering for science, standards of scientific integrity. So uh, reasonable stuff. Okay. 
So remember I highlighted for you that one statement among the ACRP uh, standards that said it would, the highest priority, the highest goal would be protecting the interests of the research subjects. And I want to explore that a little bit. And I'll go through, let me go through a number of quotes from fairly prominent people or organizations discussing what is it that happens in terms of uh, how we treat uh, research subjects. And here's Greg Kosky, who actually at the time was running OHRP, my current office. And what did he say? Uh, we have to recognize what our priorities are. If we want benefits from science that require using human subjects, we have a moral and ethical obligation to make sure we are looking out for their interests and well-being and rights. That's got to be our first priority, which sounds a lot like what the ACRP standard is, very, very similar. Um, and you could go through quotes all over it a lot on the internet and elsewhere, finding people who say similar things. Here is the uh, secretary of HHS uh, a while ago, Tommy Thompson, science and medical research should not take place at the expense of the people who participate in clinical trials. Um, this is from a New England Journal article in 2002, um, basically from uh, the head of a committee or a member of a committee for the AAMC that was discussing the standards we impose on researchers. And the guidelines are based on some core principles. The first guideline makes clear that the welfare of the patient is paramount. And he's using the word patient, but he's viewing it as a patient who's participating in a research study, so a subject. So I've selected these all because they're giving a theme. And the theme is pretty much giving the same premise that the ACRP guidelines did, that basically our first, our highest priority is protecting the well-being of the research subjects. And I want to explore that a little further. Um, so going beyond just quotes, and here we're going to a very prominent international standard. Uh, many people would probably say this is the highest standard out there. The Word Me World Medical Association's Declaration of Helsinki. I'm just going to give you a few quotes from it. So it starts out talking about physicians. Um, and so here's what it, uh, the Declaration of Geneva binds a physician with the words, the health of my patient will be my first consideration. And the International Code of Medical Ethics says a physician shall act in the patient's best interest when providing medical care. So there they're talking about the clinical side. So let's see what they say about about the research side. In medical research involving human subjects, the well-being of the individual research subject must take precedence over all other interests. Again, similar to the ACRP theme, similar to all of the quotes I gave you. Um, so uh, getting back to the theme I started with about all this, that's just not true. I mean, those are not the rules under which at least and not just in the US, across the world, what the standards are in terms of what happens in clinical research. We have a, a set of rules that are designed to provide a certain number of protections for research subjects, but it is virtually never our first priority to just protect the well-being of the research subjects. If that was our highest priority, we probably wouldn't be doing the research. The reason we're doing the research is to answer a research question. So we have set up a number of rules designed to deal with the conflict of interest here in terms of on the one hand trying to answer a research question, on the other hand trying to not take advantage and appropriate advantage of the research subjects. There is a conflict of interest involved here and by and large you're not going to be able to achieve both goals as your highest priority. So it is interesting to see these statements out there that seem a bit self-serving uh, when they say, well, of course, what we're going to try to do is, as our highest priority, keep the interests of the research subjects number one. You're just not going to do that. And so let me just give you some details of, of I mean, you could propose that, in fact, that is your goal. But if that is your goal, you're going to be doing something very, very different than what we actually do in terms of the modern research setting. And I'm just giving you some of the standard examples of what often occurs in research studies. And a lot of these will occur in your average research study. So we're not talking about anything unique and unusual here. Randomization, OK? We randomize people to, do arm, to two arms. Um, 
you will have articles out there that people will occasionally argue that randomization is a good thing for you. And, and you may hear this about a number of these things, but if it's such a good thing, then the response is, okay, how often as you, are you as a clinician randomizing your patients as part of clinical care? Um, in general, every time I ask people this, very few physicians are willing to admit that they regularly actually are randomizing patients, which gets back to a premise on if you're doing something in a realm in which there is a degree of uncertainty, just because there's uncertainty about which of two or three or four treatments might be better, that doesn't mean there aren't reasons why you actually might pick one of those four as the best thing for a particular patient. We often make decisions under uncertainty. In fact, I suspect most of the time we're making decisions under uncertainty. We live in a very, very complicated world, and more and more we're learning how complicated it is. So randomization is something that by and large is not in the best interest of the subject. Standardized treatment per protocol. In other words, you have a protocol. The protocol will explain in great detail certain things that have to be done to each subject. And the reason it does this is to get rid of noise because otherwise you're going to have a great deal of variation that's going to make it very, very hard to look at the one question you're trying to answer. Well, adhering to that protocol will often mean that you're not able to do what you would have done outside of the research setting in terms of individualizing the care of that particular patient subject. You're going to do what is best for the research study within limits. Obviously, outside of those limits, you may have to remove the person from the study, but you're not going to be able to tailor things and individualize things in a way you otherwise might want to do. Uh, extra tests and procedures. Very common in research studies. You need a certain amount of extra information that's going to help you answer the research question. These procedures, these tests, may not be all that benign, but nonetheless, you do them. Again, they may in no way affect the actual treatment of, of the subject, but again, they may, they may involve risks. Uh, finally, uh, non-disclosure of interim results. It is often the case that in the middle of a research study, halfway down the road, you may in fact have a very high degree of certainty that one particular arm is not going to win out. On the other hand, and it could be, I mean, huge, 1,000, 10,000 to 1. On the other hand, you still haven't met the standard of, of the 5% or whatever statistical significance level you need because what you're trying to do is change the behavior of, of all physicians, okay? And that's a hard test to meet. Well, if you told people a person's dying of cancer, they're in a trial in which they're getting a certain cancer treatment, and the sooner they get the treatment, the more likely you're going to cure the cancer. If you told them that you're on the arm that we know is very unlikely to be the best arm, we're not sure the other one is going to meet the 5% standard, but we're pretty sure this arm is not going to be the winner, they're going to run off immediately and get out of this trial and do something else. So we routinely don't tell people. Okay? If you were a physician in dealing with a patient, that's not the sort of thing, again, you would routinely do. You would not, in that scenario, just fail to disclose important information that a, a, a person would really, really want to know. So again, these are standard things we do in clinical research all the time. Uh, are they good for the subjects? By and large, no. It still may be in the subject's interest to enroll in a study, but we shouldn't pretend that it, the number one thing we're doing is advancing the interests of the subject. In fact, if we wanted to do that, there, in fact, are ways to do that. But we generally don't do that. Um, and this is, again, just to make it clear, this is not particularly mysterious. This is embedded in the federal regulations that govern the conduct of research. There is one provision dealing with the risk to subjects and its relationship to benefits. Risks to subjects are reasonable in relationship to benefits, if any, and the importance of the knowledge that may reasonably be expected to result. Now, that's a handful. So let me just turn it into a little equation. This is basically what it says. Risk to subjects sort of has to be in the ballpark of the other side of the equation, the sum of benefits to subjects plus benefits to society. There's that extra term there, benefits to society. Nothing in these rules requires that the risks to subjects have to be in a reasonable relationship to benefits to subjects, let alone that the benefits to subjects sort of have to somehow outweigh the risks to the subjects. Okay, so what I want to, I want to now transition now to discuss a little bit about what obligation do researchers have um, 
And I want to focus in particular about one particular type of obligation, because interestingly, this is an issue that is both important in terms of the integrity of our system, I think is hugely important, and it's been somewhat in dispute. It, it, it's actually surprising to me it's so in dispute. And this actually has a University of Chicago connection. I think it's great that I could come here and show you how the University of Chicago has at, been at the forefront of discussing some of this. And so uh, the, the issue I particularly want to talk about, which you, sounds like a fair benign and minimal requirement here, okay? Because there are, again, there are a whole bunch of obligations researchers here have, but do they have an obligation to disclose risks not created by participation in the research? That might sound a little tricky to you, okay? You enroll in a study, often the research is creating risks, but I'm going to talk about risks that weren't created by the research. They were pre-existing. The researcher is not making the risks any greater. And I would view this as a type of rule of rescue, right? We often have the notion of uh, you, you're walking by a pond, the little child is drowning there. It would be not particularly burdensome or risky to you to just step in and pull the child out. Shouldn't, as an ethical matter, any reasonable human being do that. Well, here all I'm talking about is actually disclosing a piece of information, and I'll give you examples, a piece of information that could be incredibly valuable to somebody in terms of their health and well-being. And one of the issues that has been raised here is, does it matter whether or not it's an MD researcher as opposed to a researcher who is not an MD. So this is one of these scenarios, if I was better at drawing PowerPoint slides, you'd have this Venn diagram with a big circle of MDs and a big circle of researchers, and they intersect, so there's an area of researcher MDs in the middle, and you might have an issue of are there different standards in the three parts of those circles. Um, so let me give you some details about this. Okay, so, and in particular, do researchers have some sort of fiduciary duty that might lead this to, to this scenario? So what I'm going to now talk about a little bit is some of you may know Philip Hamburger, who used to be of this institution at the law school. Yeah, and he is now at Columbia's law school. Uh, fairly prominent, uh, you know, as are a lot of University of Chicago people. He and actually others at University of Chicago got involved with being concerned about the standards by which we protect research <laughs> subjects. And just so you know the background, their concern was actually that the rules are too protective, that they're actually imposing inappropriate standards on a lot of studies that, that shouldn't be subject to these rules. And as part of this analysis, Hamburger drew this line on grounds of what it means to be a professional, saying that um, doctors have professional duties and of course are professionals, right? Hippocratic oath. Um, so you'd think researchers also owe human subjects an equivalent duty, but he goes out and basically says it. Researchers the non-doctor researchers are not professionals. You, anybody who thinks that, you're delusional. And I mean, he's known for saying some controversial things, but let's, let's go with this, because he, he makes some interesting statements here. The fiduciary duty of a professional, so these are all quotes from, from Hamburger. This was actually all in a Northwestern University Law Review publication of a symposium that was conducted about how these human subject rules were overreaching. And there's a fairly significant, actually, University of, University of Chicago contingent there. Uh, Richard Epstein had one of the articles in, in this uh, volume. I actually had an article there. I was one of the few people defending the rules, saying they weren't that unreasonable. Um, Okay, so what does he say? The fiduciary duty of a professional remains a duty to act on behalf of another, and it still arises from the professional's voluntary undertaking to exercise his conduct on behalf of his client. So you see where he's going, right? This theme of altruism that is part of a lot of professionals and professional societies. Well, if that's where you think it's a core value of being a professional, it sure sounds reasonable. Well, maybe these researchers aren't professionals because that's not what the research is about, and he spells it out, right? Researchers, in contrast, in contrast, act for themselves rather than those they study, and thus they are free to act on their own. Um, again, they're not acting, they're not trying to advance the interests of the subjects. And it sounds like, by and large, he's correct at that, okay? Within limits, they have to protect the research subjects, but it's certainly not their first priority. Their first priority is answering the research question. That's why we're doing the research in the first place. If we wanted to help the subjects, there are ways to do that outside of the research setting. Give them experimental care, for example. Make decisions that, that are in their best interests, okay? So, 
Um, okay, so now he, he particularly goes on and says that, in fact, we, if we go to classic cases out there, and this is what I think is particularly fascinating, you go to Nuremberg and Tuskegee in particular, the key wrongdoing in preeminent examples such as those is that there were doctors. So his key point, it was doctors who did all this bad stuff. Had they not been doctors, nothing bad would have been happening, perhaps. You may not believe that. I'm not sure I believe that, but, but just let's follow it. Okay, doctors who failed to live up to their professional duties. And so he goes to the Belmont Report. In case you're not familiar, this is sort of the core document on which our regulations protecting human subjects are, are based. Um, that report is based on a misunderstanding about what was wrong about the Tuskegee study. So this is fascinating that we've, we've all just misunderstood Tuskegee. And, and this is, again, big Chicago, University of Chicago elements. You have Rick Schrader, who was another person who's, they've sort of, they were actually working together in terms of criticizing the rules, who take this different approach. But I think there are some interesting arguments here. Um, and so he goes to explain what sort of was wrong in Tuskegee. Of course, it is recognized that the researchers were doctors who held themselves out as offering health care. Then the breach of a Hippocratic and fiduciary duty is obvious. Again, the wrongdoing in Tuskegee, according to him, was these were doctors. They had fiduciary duties. So you go one step further. Had they not been doctors, presumably there wouldn't have been anything wrong in terms of Tuskegee. Now, so I want to sort of play with this a little bit, and I'll be interested in your thoughts. Um, assuming this point was correct, because he's saying, you know, this was sort of a huge point, one way out of sort of this dilemma, or maybe not out of this dilemma, but a way to rethink it is, well, okay, uh, what if the physician researchers made clear that, in fact, they weren't acting in their role as a clinician? So basically, they were acting as a researcher. This is a different role than just being a physician. And is it possible in that role for them to just tell the subjects, hey, you should understand, I am not representing your best interests. They could be very forthright and say, because this is a research study, I am now acting only as a researcher, even though I have the training as an MD. Don't expect that everything I do is going to advance your best interests as a number one priority. You could probably, in fact, have them do that, which would still lead leave us with the underlying ethical and professional issue. Okay, what about these researchers, regardless of whether they're MDs or not? Should they, in fact, have some responsibilities to the subjects, the sort of responsibilities that Hamburger is saying do not exist? And in fact, I just would point out, it's actually, a lot of people would say, again, it's perfectly okay to say that what legitimates our system is in fact having physician researchers make appropriate disclosures. Roles in fact matter, and our society allows people to change their role in various scenarios. And I'm just giving you a number of examples here. Uh, we could discuss it further during the discussion. If you haven't read Charles Fried, Charles Fried is a very smart lawyer who was Solicitor General of the U.S. He was on the Massachusetts highest court. He is a Harvard Law professor. And he actually wrote a little book about research ethics. I think it was called Medical Experimentation in the 70s. And it is a brilliant book. And people talk about it all the time without having read it. And what they will do is they will say Freed is the one who often is said to have come up with a concept of equipoise and that Benji Friedman borrowed it from Freed or something. Freed's book, what Freed actually says is he doesn't even seem to care that equipoise is even meaningful or you need it. What he was basically negating was a notion that at the time you had people enrolling women, for example, in breast cancer studies where they were studying lumpectomy versus a modified radical mastectomy, a much bigger procedure, and they weren't getting permission. They weren't getting any kind of consent. And the rationale was, in fact, because the people were claiming, well, we're not sure which of these is better. Therefore, how could it be wrong to just assign somebody to one of these or another and not tell them anything about it? So he was basically actually criticizing the people who were promoting equipoise, saying, this is absurd. There are many reasons one of these women would prefer one arm to the other. 
Uh, and it's still true in, in lots of studies is reasons why somebody would prefer one arm to the other. What Fried said is you should let them know. And part of letting them know was you let them know that, hey, I'm not the one making the decision for you here. Don't view me as your doctor. Look to somebody else here. So he didn't have any problem with, with clarifying your role. Um, the other scenarios, when I'm talking about other non-standard roles, I'm sure you've had lots of discussion here about some of these issues. Um, the scenario in which, for example, a physician involved in a, a state-ordered execution, they may be there at the time of the execution, uh, physicians in the military involved in interrogation. Let's assume in both of those scenarios, this is all legitimated by our society. You may disagree with it, but let's presume we came up with some scenario in which this is okay. You will often get groups like the AMA criticizing physicians participating in executions, but on the other hand, they are not taking a position against the execution. All they're saying is it is wrong for the physician to participate. I think a lot of us, correctly, I would say, say that's a fairly hypocritical position. That is a professional organization acting in its own self-interest. They're saying it's fine to have the execution, just don't have the physicians who actually are the people with the expertise to make sure it actually occurs in the most ethical manner. We don't want to have anything to do with it, which is of course great because it's not like there are thousands of physicians who are members of the AMA who are going to protest this conclusion or something. So it, it's very easy for that sort of group to criticize this. And by the way, there's a history of, of negating that. You go back to Karen Ann Quinlan. One of the key things in the Karen Ann Quinlan scenario that the court made very clear was at the time the physician said this was what? removing. I guess she was on a ventilator, taking her off the vent. They said, well, our current standards of professionalism would not allow us to ever kill a patient by taking her off this machine. And the court said, well, tough. You better change your standards because this is the right thing to do. You have to turn off that machine. And that's similar, actually, to what courts have said about physician participation in execution. I think there's a S South Carolina case that said, you know, we don't care what the medical society does. You cannot pull a, a physician's license because they're participating in a state-approved execution. It is for society to determine this. As long as they're not acting in the role as a, as a physician treating that patient, this is perfectly acceptable. So, okay, so let me play with this the final few minutes and then we could sort of discuss some of this stuff. So that since, since uh, Hamburg was talking about Tuskegee, let me get back to a scenario that I think is highly relevant to very real issues happening now. Tuskegee actually involved a lot of bad things. Hopefully most of us would agree there are a lot of bad things happening in that study. Um, even taking Hamburger's criticisms. And it involved, for example, actively preventing subjects from learning about their disease. Um, let's assume it, they weren't that, that bad, okay? What if there wasn't an active role, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that, a more passive role, and in particular, would it matter if non-MDs had done the research as opposed to MDs? So we'll look at that difference, okay? So let me give you a study called Tuskegee today. Certainly could do it today, and there are real studies taking place these days that are not all that different than this. A researcher is studying disease X. He finds a poorly, a set of poorly informed subjects, okay? They may not even be aware of the details relating to their condition. Maybe they're not even aware they have a particular disease. And the researcher intends to collect long-term information from them, not revealing let's assume it's true that there's actually an effective treatment for this medical problem they have. So, for example, the researcher interviews them and says, look, I mean, I'm studying, you know, the health condition of people in your, your rural town or something. Would it be okay if I talked to you once a month and got information from you, okay? And it, it may, let's assume they're upfront and make it clear, look, I'm not going to treat you or anything, but I'd like you to help me out, okay? And they know that this is a treatable condition, okay? Is that an ethical thing to do, okay? Let me explain again, because I wanted to point out, this is a very real issue these days. There was a case called Grimes versus Kennedy Krieger Institute. Um, this is probably the most prominent litigated case out there, certainly in decades, uh, relating to research ethics in this country. It went up to the highest court in the state of Maryland. Um, and what it was about was reducing risk from lead paint in children living in Baltimore, in inner city Baltimore, 
many, many homes had were tons of lead paint. Kids routinely eat the lead paint, uh, routinely gets into their brains, a very bad thing. Kennedy Krieger was the Hopkins-related institute that had put lead paint problems on the map. And it was actually coming up with scenarios for actually reducing lead paint hazards by trying to figure out cheap ways to actually improve the housing. So like wash down the walls for a few hundred dollars. Because these homes were there. It was legal to have little kids living in them. The health authorities wouldn't do anything about it because we did not have the money. It, was, it cost too much to actually you know, repair the homes. It cost more than the homes were actually worth. Okay? So this was actually an important study. Some of the, a uh, couple of the parents of subjects sued, said a number of bad things happened in this study, including failure of informed consent and negligence in study design and a number of other things. Well, so one of the issues in this case was what duties did the researchers have to the subjects? And so here's a quote from the court. And many people will criticize the case, and, and I will too. On many grounds, it was a horrible case. They fault the researchers. They, they analogize this study to, to Nazis and to the Japanese doing horrible things during World War II and to canaries in the mines. And actually, it was not that horrible a study. But let's not go there. On the other hand, it's also been criticized for creating a particular duty. So let's see what they said. Whether the duty of informed consent created by federal regulations translates into a duty of care excuse me, arising out of a unique relationship that is research or subject as opposed to doctor-patient. And in, they got very specific. It concluded there can be a duty to warn regarding dangers present when the researcher has knowledge of the potential for harm to the subject and the subject is unaware of the danger. So what they were talking about in this case, and it's unclear whether or not, in fact, that researchers mm -hmm. didn't do a good enough job, but were they having the kids sit in these homes and <coughs> not adequately warning the parents of the risk to the kid of eating the lead paint and getting brain damage, okay? So I want to point out, some people out there, very distinguished scholars, find the Grimes opinion troubling, uh, particularly in terms of this finding about this duty. And so let me give you a, these are very, very prominent people, uh, two scholars at uh, the University of Maryland. Um, the real danger of the court's opinion is the possibility that it will significantly reduce public health studies. And the notion being that if you have to tell subjects about a risk that you didn't create, we're not going to be able to go out there and study what's really happening. And so that is the question I'm actually going to leave you with. Um, and so here's a quote. They are concerned. They're giving you a possibility of a study. Could a researcher study a population that exposes his children to a diet without certain nutrients, or would the researcher be required to tell the subjects of the risks of such a diet? So you found this group that, based on your studies ahead of time, you think the kids are not getting a certain key nutrient. And you know, for example, this nutrient may cause very, very serious permanent damage to these children. And I think what they want to do is be able to do that study and not tell the parents. Remember, the researchers aren't creating the risk. They're not doing anything to the risk, but they're asking, well, do we have to sort of tell the parents? And I guess I would ask, so, okay, these are major questions asked by prominent people these days, very thematically similar to what Phil Hamburger was raising. And I'm not sure how different is that from if you did the Tuskegee Today scenario. And what I find interesting is what, what does this tell us? Because our core rules that we're talking about here stem from Tuskegee. Tuskegee was the motivating event that caused us to write all these regulations, or certainly one of the major events. So if we're going to a scenario now where we're saying, because it's important to do public health studies, it is perfectly acceptable, okay, to have researchers be sitting there having a piece of information that may be of very great importance to this group of subjects. Okay, so we're not talking about changing their behavior or anything, but just letting them know, is that all that different than what troubled many, many people in the early 70s when the Tuskegee headlines got out there, that we had U.S. researchers sitting there with these subjects having syphilis, knowing there was a cure. Now, granted, they went further than that, but let's assume they didn't go further. Um, so I think I'm just going to leave it with that question. And Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So, so my opinion would be is that there is such a duty, but it doesn't come from the researcher role. It just comes from being like a fellow human being role. Okay. You shouldn't let 
Sure. Okay. That's my opinion. Right. And, and I think that's a great point. And, but that gets back to, see, the rescuing the little girl is an ethical duty, and, and I think most people in ethics will certainly say it's there. But as a society, in terms of laws and regulations, which basically then there are penalties for you not doing something, we in general don't enforce those sorts of duties. Rules of rescue are not something that in this country are, are usually enforced. And we can get into an interesting discussion of there are some countervailing arguments as to why actually we have a bigger problem with people actually rushing in to rescue people and harming themselves than people not rescuing. But our regulations effectively, the issue might be, should our regulations be interpreted as imposing such a duty? Because that is going beyond just ethics and saying, we as a society in terms of the integrity of research are going to not allow those studies to take place anymore. So that's just going one point beyond what you said. But it's not exactly analogous because the researchers benefit benefiting from the study. Right. And it's like if it's your pond, then you might have a duty to rescue the girl. So, so there, you're saying there are greater reasons that the researcher in that scenario should have a greater duty than even uh, your reasonable human being. Okay, and, and absolutely. But all I'm saying is that buttresses the notion that we as a society should be interpreting our current rules as saying, you know, even if you could do more studies by, by doing this, by not adhering to this rule, we don't want to do those studies. We think the minimal, one of the duties that exists out there that is enforceable is that you can't be sitting there and not disclosing uh, uh, an important risk item when you know this could be huge to the subjects. And it seems like you could still do the study. It might complicate yes, the analysis absolutely. of the data. but. Right. You Right, and for example, I think the, the Grimes study is a good example, okay? Uh, a lot of us, if you, you, you could look at the consent form, it's actually on the web. They actually do indicate they're not gonna eliminate all the, the lead hazard. I suspect, again, these were, you know, these were expert lead paint researchers. They were not trying to hide the fact that there was a lead paint hazard there, but you're absolutely right. You should be able to conduct any studies. On, on the issues that were just raised and your distinction between what's legally required mm -hmm. and what everybody, I think, would probably agree is ethically required, what about Good Samaritan laws? Because they do apply to specific professionals who could be defined either as the researchers or the MDs sure. or both. Yeah. So good, my understanding is there are actually very few Good Samaritan laws that actually require somebody to actively aid. They Most of them re remove your likelihood. They'll, they'll set a higher standard of like gross negligence in terms of when you will be harmed. And interestingly, oh, so it's interesting sort of six degrees of separation. David Hyman, uh, who's a, a law professor at what, University of Illinois, um, was actually one of the people who got into this issue sort of with Rick Schrader and Phil Hamburger in terms of criticizing. He's one of the major critics of the, the human subjects rules with many other distinguished people. In fact, there was, uh, what's the American Association of University Professors with, uh, who's the MIT professor who did the scenario of the, the abortion and the violinist hookup to... Uh, you're right. She was a, a member of the committee, and I think Hyman wrote that report. He's actually wrote a very interesting paper analyzing, again, who rescues. And again, his paper is the one that sets, if you look at the numbers, we lose far more people are injured because they rush into cars that are about to explode or something than the people who are actually injured from not being rescued. I don't know whether that's true or not, but he is sort of these free economic sort of I analyses or something. So, but by and large, right, we don't actually, as a legal matter, force people to do stuff. We just set higher standards so that they can't be sued on the theory that knowing that standard will encourage you to, to move in or something. Seems to me that one way to um, at least address it in the design, and this goes back to Robert was suggesting in such a study, would be to have some sort of um, equivalent of a rescue rule within that. So let's say you randomize people to an intervention for palliative care versus usual, usual care, and you discover um, that in the usual care arm there are people who you know, are getting a 10 out of 10 pain scale, right? Uh, a 10 out of 10 score on their pain on scale. Their pain. Okay. Um, and um, one way to do that is, well, for science, we're just continuing this, and I didn't cause that pain. It's being caused by, you know, the people who were caring for them. Um, but a way to, to be able to do that and still, I think, um, uh, get 
data, which would be more complicated uh, to analyze, would be to have a sort of stopping rule that if the people in that you know, get a 10 out of 10 or 8 out of 10 score, uh, that you then, re you know, set yourself to rescue the person at that point, um, and then you've got data that could be um, sure. analyzed. Um, it does allow this kind of study uh, to go on, and it can give you meaningful data, but does, but also meets, I think, the standard um, of giving um, an opportunity to rescue uh, the person. So I take it your starting position yeah. is that you wouldn't need to get consent for the initial intervention? You would, you know, in the con in the cons um, in the consent, you, you wouldn't, um, I think, have to, um, you know, sort of s say more than sort of usual, you know, yeah. usual care, yeah. right? Um, because you don't want to sort of tip, tip, them tip off. people off in the way that would do it. As long as you've got built into it the sort of safety mechanism, right. and you could, you know, put language into this if it looks like yeah, that would be vaguer. It looks like you're going to be harmed. We will, you know, in, uh, intervene. Right. I mean, that's the kind yeah. of approach I think that that from what Robert was suggested, is suggesting would allow this kind of study to go on without sort of creating the Hawthorne effects that would perhaps right. yeah. damage the research but yet fulfill the responsibility of the researcher to rescue the individual who's harmed. Yeah, it's a tricky scenario because yeah. then you're back, right, how good is your rescue and how are, how's our society going to view that, that you're back to the scenario of, of how unconscionable, you, it really depends on what the piece of information is that you're studying in terms of their behavior. Uh, this is a big issue, by the way, in terms of just research in general, uh, cluster randomized trials where you're randomizing people in terms of different locations where they live or different hospitals or different buildings uh, are a very big item and uh, a number of groups that uh, Canadians have uh, a lot of a research ethics group studying this right now because it's very hard to get consent in those scenarios and right does it create Hawthorne effect or something else. Uh, we're actually on the cusp of a lot of interesting areas in terms of doing sort of you know different types of QIQA research that are hard to do otherwise and they're not easy answers to these questions. Could you say in general terms your goals of changing the regs and the likelihood you'll be successful? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I will not put any predictions on likelihood. Um, clearly, the Health and Human Services at the moment is supportive of trying to change the regulations. Um, from my viewpoint, in, in our, which, our... How? Yeah. Our, well, our goal, okay, this is all out there, probably more stuff than you want to find out. If you Google OHRP, you will get to one of the first two or three things will be OHRP's main website. On the very front page, there's a big blue button at the bottom. If you click on that, it will get you to the actual proposal, which went out for public comment from July to October of 2011. And over 1,100 sets of comments, which are searchable from pretty much any major organization in modern medicine these days, including a lot of fascinating groups that you may not day-to-day -day interact with. But I personally am very interested in like information use and everything. So so Latanya Sweeney, if you're aware, she's the person, professor who now is, is on leave at Harvard, who found out that the governor of Massachusetts's medical records were in a public release of information that was on the web mm. because she was able to look up the date at which he was treated and a few other pieces of information. So information privacy experts, uh, all the usuals, American Cancer Society, AAMC, I mean, you name it. Uh, I don't know if the University of Chicago made a comment, but it is quite fascinating to read all this stuff. Uh, seven proposals, one of which is har should there be harmonization of um, the interpretation guidance on the regulations across the various federal agencies. The way the system works, the same set of rules is administered by 18 different federal agencies. Um, improving informed consent, should we be able to do a better job in terms of writing consent forms, and it gives some specifics that we think are reasonable ways to actually improve consent forms and make them far better of an actual decision-making tool that a person should be making an informed decision about being in a study. Uh, in multi-center studies, having one central IRB for the domestic sites in these studies, um, creating a uniform floor of privacy rules in most studies so that the IRB doesn't have to spend that much time in terms of figuring this stuff out. Um, a number of rules relating to the various categories of IRB review. Um, 
enlarging a number of studies that can be in this exam category and eliminating the need for always having an IRB or an administrator to review very many low-risk studies. So for example, a competent adult who's being asked to answer questions. Even if they're being asked for some private identifiable information, if it's a competent adult, is there any reason that you really need somebody to review this? We're asked questions all the time, and there's not a review panel. So researchers sometimes appropriately complain, why are they doing anything more evil than the marketer or something who wants a bunch of information from you? So that's giving you a flavor of some of this stuff. Some of it is fairly complicated. And again, we got a lot of the comments have been hugely helpful. Um, if and when this thing goes out again for comment, I'm sure there will be changes made due to the comments. Um, so I was thinking, even if you agree that there is a duty to warn, say for a particular study it was important that they not be warned, could that be in the consent that there, there wouldn't be a warning even if the researchers were right. to become aware of some right. risk? Right. And that, so would that be accessi yeah. acceptable? So that is a great question. So you get into this tricky issue of to what extent are you getting adequate consent when you're telling somebody that you're not giving them certain information, and the key issue there is what information do they know that helps them interpret that missing piece of information. There was a, I'll go back to my wonderful year here, there was a wonderful case called Leah's case, which was a real consult at the time about a young woman from a particular Orthodox Jewish group that came over here from Israel with her father. And she had a particular, and this was written up by John Lantos. He is a wonderful write-up of it. And the issue was, the woman actually, she was about, she was engaged, she had some sort of uterine tumor. Um, she wasn't aware that she had a tumor and that what they were proposing to do was to do a hysterectomy, which would have made her non-marriageable under Jewish Orthodox law. And the parents hadn't told her that, and the doctors hadn't told her much of anything other than you have a problem, your father, who was the head of the family and usually made the decisions, wants to make decisions for you. And she knew all this, and in the meeting she would say, that's okay with me. I want to let my father make the decisions. I think the concern of most of the people, uh, there was one member of the very large group reviewing this, was she had no clue what was going to happen to her. So even though she was saying, I'm okay with you not telling me, it was not informed enough because she, all she knew was some medical procedure was going to take place. Do you agree to let your father decide even if one possible decision he might make if you agree, is that you could have a hysterectomy and be well, made unmarriageable. Well, I didn't want to tell, right, I mean. Which it, wouldn't be telling her that that was it, that that right. would, yeah, the just tricky, that that's an example. No, I understand that, but the tricky thing is, how do you give somebody a piece of information to get them enough informed when the whole purpose of the thing is not to give them that piece of information? So it's the same scenario of, of a person consenting ahead of time when they start out a medical relationship of, well, if I'm dying of cancer, don't tell me. So at least at that point, you're not worried about it. But the problem here was you already had a specific problem that everybody knew the details of. And yes, one scenario was you could have given her a list of 10 of these things, but probably the moment you gave her the list, they would be equally concerned that, that she would then commit suicide that, and whatever. Yeah, it was a great case, but it, exactly your issue. How do you get appropriately informed consent when the whole key is not giving too much information? In that case and that's very, very here. hard to do. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that case was from this institution. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, no, it was. It was right yeah. here. We, yeah. It was Herbst. I want to thank Jerry for coming today and wishing you good luck as you go back to Washington. Uh, thank you. It's my pleasure. Election season. Thank you. Thank you.